Laudator Jesus Christus, praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, who is the Editor-in-Chief of CFN. Hello, Brian. I wish you a, a good last day of the month of March for the year 2022. Hard to believe we're already through March. Uh, that it is. I can't believe it'll be April tomorrow. Yes. All right. Well, we've got a good lineup of stories for you. That's been uh, almost a week since uh, the historic consecration of Russia and Ukraine. So we'll be discussing that today, of course, kind of a recap of last week's events. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also going to look at several rather disturbing remarks that have been made recently by President Joe Biden, roughly over the past couple of weeks. Um, some kind of gaffes and other things. Uh, maybe he said the quiet part out loud. We're not exactly sure, <laughs> uh, but we'll take a look at those. Also, some major developments, uh, speaking of the Biden family, in the ongoing saga of Hunter Biden and his infamous laptop, with which the uh, mainstream news has finally decided to accept as legitimate and real. Um, convenient timing. <clears throat> Also, a private gathering of modernist clergy and theologians, I use the term loosely in this context, uh, in Chicago to discuss the concerns about opposition, to discuss their concerns about opposition to Pope Francis and Vatican II. They're worried that the youngsters, uh, people in maybe Brian's generation, my generation, and younger are not getting on board with the, the revolution like they should be in their minds. And then finally, we have, uh, we're going to end on a kind of a somber note somewhat, but a moving reflection on the tragic death of Terry Schiavo. Uh, she was tragically starved to death, basically. She was on, um, she had a terrible car accident and was very badly injured, had a brain injury, and she died 17 years ago today. And so her brother has published a reflection on her death and mm -hmm. how we should be remembering uh, what happened to her and not allow that to happen to other people. Mm. So that's our lineup for today. And as we said earlier, we're coming to you live on uh, Thursday, March 31st, the year of our Lord, 2022. And today on the traditional liturgical calendar, it is a Lenten feria, a feria of Lent. Today is the Thursday of the fourth week in Lent. So on Sunday, this past Sunday, we celebrated Laetare Sunday, which is, I guess you could say, the equivalent of Gaudete Sunday during Advent. And I just wanted to read today's uh, collect for Mass. I think it's very, very beautiful and a good reflection point for us uh, for liturgical and spiritual reflection. So it says, Grant, Almighty God, we beseech thee that these fasts which we which chasten may also fill us with holy joy, so that with our earthly affections weakening, we may more easily lay firm hold, a firm hold on the things of heaven. So it's a reminder of why we're doing the fasting that we're doing. And every day the collects in the traditional missal is such a a blatant reminder that we are mm -hmm. supposed to be doing physical fasting during Lent. And obviously that's been completely removed from the new missile. Um, you know, on a daily basis, if you read the collects for the, the Lenten yeah. daily masses, it's all, every, re every one of them almost has a reference to fasting. Yeah. I, I think almost everyone. Yeah. At some point has a reference to it where, you know, they, they were systematically removed. Yes. Very sad. Yes. So coming up on the liturgical calendar, before we get into the news, uh, this coming Sunday is a very important Sunday liturgically. It's known as Passion Sunday. It's the Sunday prior to Palm Sunday. Maybe Brian can tell us a little bit about the liturgical significance of Passion Sunday. Yeah, it it sort of Lent is broken into two periods, the sort of general Lent and then this intense period. So it marks kind of a, a it, it's good the church knows maybe we've waned a little bit. We're a little lax, slacking off and it's like, okay, wake up. You know, you need to get this. We're heading, heading, heading into the final days, uh, the mm -hmm. last two weeks. And so it's meant to intensify uh, our our spiritual uh, efforts. And uh, it it's a, we, we notice it liturgically. Uh, in in several ways, 
um, the most uh, visible that, that often will appear are the statues are covered. So the statues and all the images in the church uh, are covered. Mm -hmm. And that's supposed to represent so for two purposes, one, they were supposed to be putting away earthly things, thinking of the things, mm -hmm. the, the spiritual realities. And so uh, we are sort of depriving ourselves of the spiritual consolation of seeing the beautiful statues, crucifixes, etc. So mm -hmm. just as we're denying ourselves food, we sort of want to chastise the sight and, and take those away. But also, I'll, I'll, I think Guaranger reflects on this too, but other writers have said, that it represents the uh, saints from the Old Testament in limbo. So they were mm. saved, but they were shrouded in, in limbo. And yes. then on the Easter vigil at the Gloria, they are unveiled, which, sort of rec which was a, a reference liturgically to the, the harrowing of hell when our Lord went to limbo and brought the redemption, the news of the redemption to, to those saints. So that's the, the physical thing that you will notice. And then liturgically, also, if you're listening, attuned, there's also some suppressions. Again, it's kind of depriving ourselves a little bit. So Psalm 42 is suppressed. We have mm -hmm. very short, shorter prayers at the foot of the altar. So the, the Psalms, which again are a consolation, are, are taken away for two weeks. The, mm -hmm. Some of the Gloria Patris are, are suppressed throughout the, the liturgy. And we get a different preface. So we go from the preface of Lent to the preface of the Holy Cross. So we're, yes. we're first focused on ourselves. What are we doing for Lent? We then shift to focus on the cross, which is coming up for the next two weeks of, of Passion uh, Passion Tide from Passion Sunday. The first, uh, really, Palm Sunday's technical name in the in the missal is the second Passion Sunday. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of colloquial called, you know, more colloquially called Palm Sunday because of the palms, yeah. but it's this second Passion Sunday. So we're, we're sort of rounding the bend for the home stretch, and the church is saying, get ready. Yes. Very good. Well, thank you for that. And I also noticed in the comments, people uh, thanking you for the, the new video series, The Mass Explained. We're very glad that yes. that's helping folks and we'll look forward to future uh, installments yes. of that series. And someone also mentioned uh, this coming Saturday is the first Saturday. It's also tomorrow will be the first Friday. So if you can go to Mass and receive our Lord and Holy Communion for first Friday and first Saturday, yes. that would be a very good thing to do. All right, and then uh, also coming up on the liturgical calendar, we have uh, on Monday next week, April 4th, is St. Isidore, a bishop and doctor of the church, Isidore of Seville, hmm. and also a saint uh, seeming very appropriate for our current circumstances, as we shall see today in our news <laughs> report. Uh, next week, Tuesday, April 5th, is the feast of St. Vincent Ferrer, the famous Dominican preacher who uh, died in the year of our Lord, 1419. And he was actually known, officially recognized in the papal bowl of canonization as the angel of the apocalypse, because he was famous for preaching about the end times, the last judgment, and uh, bringing many, you know, tens of thousands of souls to repentance, conversion, and uh, even among the Jewish population and Muslims, a uh, very effective preacher. Yeah, he didn't just say he didn't just say stay be a good you know be a good Muslim. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly right. <laughs> All right, well, we will open today's show with a brief recap. We've already discussed it in, in other mm. uh, broadcasts, and there's an articles on our website. So we'll just briefly recap uh, the consecration from last Friday. As we know, Pope Francis uh, solemnly consecrated in St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, let's see, quote ourselves the church and all humanity especially russia and ukraine and he did that to the the immaculate heart of mary he went on to say accept this act that we carry out with confidence and love grant that war may end and peace spread throughout the world and presumably he's speaking specifically in reference to the, the situation in ukraine but there obviously are other wars and conflicts going on in our world as well so hmm. Um, I did offer uh, earlier this week, and we published on our website an, a brief article that I wrote, called basically just report and analysis. So that's available on our website. And then uh, yesterday I was on the, the One Peter Five podcast to offer some further analysis with uh, Timothy Flanders, who is the editor in chief at One Peter Five. And I have that video embedded in at the end of my uh, article. So if you're interested in further analysis, you can check that out. But it, Basically, the long and short of it is 
uh, as Brian mentioned, the day of the consecration after it happened, um, our Lord tells us in the gospel that we shall know a tree by its fruit, and also by their fruits you shall know them, Matthew 7, 16. And while he, our Lord was speaking specifically about discerning between true and false shepherds in that context, I think we can say the same principle can be applied to human acts and whether or not they conform to God's will, including the recent consecration. And mm -hmm. ultimately, uh, as Brian has observed and others have observed, Our Lady herself has told us what those fruits are that we should be looking for. She said, and she promised, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me. And number one, she shall be converted. So that's the first fruit we should mm -hmm. be looking for, a conversion of the Russian nation to Catholic unity. That's what that means. And then also a period of peace will be granted to the world. So those two primary fruits are what we should be looking for. I don't know if Brian has anything else yeah. he wanted to add there. A absolutely. But again, we need to be careful because with prophecy, everything will make sense after everything happens. So, you know, yeah. anyone who's going around telling you what's going to happen next <clears> week <throat> as a, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Again, people can speculate. Um, even with the vision of the third secret we have, you know, some people so we don't, you know, well, that hasn't happened yet. What we don't know because, and mostly because we don't have the text of the third secret. Right. I mean, she could have said, uh, shortly after the consecration is achieved, this will happen, right? So we don't even know when that vision fits into the scheme yeah. of things, right? Right. Some people predicted maybe that would happen, then the Pope, the next Pope would consecrate Russia. Again, the point is we just don't know until it happens. And we also right. don't know how to interpret that vision because the Vatican adamantly refuses to release the text of the third secret, which would likely help to at least eliminate some right. possibilities. Uh, but in terms of updates, the only other updates that are, are new since our last broadcast is we have, there's been now confirmation that every U.S. diocese participated in some way in the consecration, which again is a very good sign in terms of the, the in communion with all the bishops and they didn't say every single bishop but but in many ways you know when sister lucia talked about each bishop in his own cathedral to me i've always understood that the emphasis is that the diocesan bishop that it's that, you know not every single bishop here there a functionary in the vatican who's a bishop but it's really was focused on like in every diocese the bishop as the head of his diocese Right. Um, you know, participated. And maybe he's got an auxiliary, auxiliary here or there that, that wasn't there. So again, that's really good to hear. I, I don't know why they wouldn't tell us that when we asked the USCCB what's going on, right. but that did come out. Um, and then we have a brief update really on what uh, happened in Fatima. Uh, we were trying to get this on the day, but due to some technical difficulties, uh, uh, Benedict Carter, who has, has submitted some things to Catholic Family News uh, in the past, uh, who is an English traditional Catholic, has lived in Fatima on and off three different times over the years and has also lived in Russia, lives about 400 yards from the Kovede area, uh, the, the place, the spot where Our Lady appeared to the children. And uh, yes. I spoke with him in between our last broadcast. I'm just going to play briefly a little bit of our conversation where he gives us a report on what he saw in Fatima on the 25th. We were on Rome, obviously, last Friday when Pope Francis pronounced a solemn consecration uh, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But uh, Fatima, obviously, is where that request came from, a, a request of the Blessed Mother to consecrate, in a special way, Russia to her Immaculate Heart, 1917. And the Pope, I think, aware of that, sent uh, a, an envoy, a representative there. Maybe tell us a little bit about what happened in Fatima. I know that the papal almoner was there. Were there other Portuguese bishops there? Who, who what, in terms of bishops? Who yes, the, the ceremony, um, Brian, was led by the papal almoner, uh, Car, uh, Conrad Cardinal uh, Kraszewski, if I've got hmm. that right. I'm, I'm not quite sure with my Polish pronunciation. Yes, yes. And um, uh, he led the entire uh, um, uh, one hour long service, I guess you can call it, ceremony. Um, and all the Portuguese bishops did appear to be there. Oh, um, wow. wow. And as, as I mentioned to somebody, uh, Our Lady may well accept this consecration. We shall have to see. But she certainly won't accept ever the array of 1969 uh, Summer of Love pectoral crosses <laughs> and uh, bizarrely colored copes that were on display. But um, uh. but certainly they, they did seem to all to be there, yeah. And it, it really, I would describe the whole thing as being a, 
a very good example of a novus ordo solemnity. Um, <laughs> So uh, but, it's you know, almost an oxymoron. <laughs> well, well, exactly as, as yes. solemn as it as it can get. Yes, yes. <clears throat> but I, I don't want to uh, throw too many stones. I mean, yes. as a traditionalist Catholic, it would be easy to do so. Yeah. The the chant was you know nineteen seventies dirge like, <laughs> Gregorian chant, um, uh, but there were aspects of it that were deeply moving. In fact. Hmm. Um, the uh, the uh, joyful mysteries of the rosary were said in different languages. Hmm. Um, the cardinal started that, uh, and and one of the mysteries, I think it was the second mystery, was um, said. Um, I couldn't quite work out. I I'm, I do speak Russian. I, I spent um, twelve years hmm. living in Russia, okay. so I, I do speak Russian, and therefore I I certainly know the difference between Russian and Ukrainian. Yes. <laughs> um, it, 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 it's similar to the difference between Portuguese and Spanish. Hmm. They're, they're kind of that that distance apart. Yes. Um, but whether the the mystery was said uh, certainly by a Greek Catholic priest, um, uh, whether it was said in uh, Church Slavonic or Ukrainian, I couldn't quite work out. Hmm. Church Slavonic effectively being medieval Russian, which yes. the, the Russians themselves don't understand now. Yes. Um, so, but but it, it was it was well done and it was reverently done. And um, so after the rosary, um, uh, I did notice during the rosary, I had a look around, and there, there were plenty of Ukrainian flags on display, and that didn't surprise me at all because, um, uh, funnily enough, in Fatima, uh, in a, as I said, a population of about ten thousand, there are actually about four hundred Ukrainians living here. And again, that's uh, the substance of his his report. Uh, but he did, you know, did say, did confirm that it appeared all the Portuguese mm -hmm. bishops appeared. And again, it was a very, you know, if if a bit novus ordo, uh, solemn and serious ceremony. He he comments a little later in our conversation on the papal almoner, the cardinal was did appear very sincere. He looked very sincerely at the statue, much like I observe with Pope Francis himself. I mean, he. Right. For all of his foibles, uh, does did seem, you know, does seem to believe in the Blessed Mother and did seem to you know have a devotion to her. He kissed the statue. Um, again, all that we should be, you know, we, we this is really an important moment for us to prove that we're not just sort of de facto in practice say of a contest, right? Because what is our position? We, you know, we have to resist the Pope when he goes against faith and morals. But if we just sort of nitpick everything, and I'll tell you what I saw on the internet, you know, this week, for example, I saw people ranting, oh, this is invalid because he was sitting during the consecration. He was sitting in a chair, and that was an insult to the mother of God. I, and again, I just sort of thought, well, first of all, if you watch the video, I, I, the Pope has seriously deteriorated in his health in the past six months, six, nine months. I mean, he could barely move. He looked like he had gained maybe 100 or 150 pounds. Uh, my estimate. And uh, you may recall, many of our viewers don't know this, but Padre Pio, at the end of his life, saying the traditional mass, not he never said a Novus Ordo, was given a dispensation to say mass seated. They set a chair in front of the altar, raised mm -hmm. up to the right height, and because he couldn't, he just couldn't hold himself up. He couldn't stand uh, throughout the, the length of his mass. So again, I think we have to be careful about, you know, not just because of the bad things he does, just sort of immediately, oh, he was sitting down, that was an insult, that, and, and, and be, you know, cautious, where, you know, where we have to say, look, he got this, this is totally wrong, we, we certainly do that at Catholic Family News, right. but if we just sort of say he's incapable of doing anything, do, you know, do we really believe what we say, we say that he's, he is holding the papal office, and we do have to pay attention to it. We can't just disregard him. So uh, they're just my sort of new, I guess, final thoughts for this week. Yes. So uh, to close up this story, I just wanted to share uh, Pope Francis did allude to the consecration over the weekend on mm -hmm. Sunday after his Angelus address. So he began by saying, uh, more than a month has gone by since the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine, of the beginning of this cruel and senseless war that, like every war, represents a defeat for everyone, for every one of us. <clears throat> he went on to say, before the danger of self-destruction, may humanity understand that the moment has come to abolish war, to erase it from human history before it erases human history. 
Now, I think that is, it's an interesting statement because, you know, respectfully, I think we should remember here that according to Our Lady of Fatima, war is a punishment for sin. It is a chastisement, mm. as Our Lady made very clear in her messages to the children. So I don't know if it's really possible for, you know, if we want to abolish war, then we need to be hearing a message of repentance, you know, stop offending God and be converted and, and practice the true faith. Uh, that's that's going to be the means of abolishing war. Mm. <clears throat> and he here's where he alluded to the recent consecration. He said, quote, let us continue to pray untiringly to the Queen of Peace, to whom we consecrated humanity, in particular Russia and Ukraine, with such a huge and intense participation, for which I thank all of you. And then he led the people gathered in St. Peter's Square, or wherever he was giving the Angelus uh, in praying a Hail Mary together. So the other thing I wanted to mention before we move on to our uh, presidential reporting, Ironically, on the day of the Con Friday, March 25th, yeah. uh, the Vatican hosted the World Council of Churches for their annual ecumenical meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and the, you know, obviously the irony is more than it's twofold, really. It's the irony that Our Lady of Fatima is about as far from ecumenism as you can get. She's calling people to convert and embrace the one true faith. So, it's ironic that on the same day the consecration happened, we had this meeting going on at the Vatican. But then the further irony is the fact that the WCC was thoroughly infiltrated. We This has been thoroughly documented by multiple sources, one of which is uh, uh, Lieutenant General Ian Mahai Pachepa, the author of this book, mm -hmm. co-authored by uh, Ronald Rishlak, who contributed an article a few weeks ago for us. And so the, the, the uh, WCC was thoroughly infiltrated decades ago by the Soviet KGB, including <laughs> the current patriarch uh, of Moscow, Kirill, codenamed Mikhailov, who was one of the, uh, and this organization and Kirill in particular is one of the primary vehicles for spreading liberation theology, which is essentially Marxism, the errors of Russia throughout the world, especially in mm. Latin America. So very ironic that on the day of the consecration, the WCC was hosted at the Vatican. <laughs> yes, yes. And speaking of the errors of Russia and uh, Marxism, communism, uh, our own, very own Joe Biden um, said, uh, this just recently came to light, he actually said these words on March 21st, so a few days before the consecration, during a meeting with a group of American CEOs he was addressing, he said, quote, there's going to be a new world order out there and we've got to lead it. I think we have video footage. Yeah, this is where sure. I, think, I think he's he's saying the quiet part out loud. <laughs> yes. I think, you know, my mother had an expression out of everything terrible, something good will come if you look hard enough for it. I think this presents us with some significant opportunities to make some real changes. You know, we are at an inflection point, I believe, in the world economy. Not just the world economy, in the world. It occurs every three or four generations. As one of, them, as the, uh, one of the top military people said to me in a secure meeting the other day, 60, 60 million people died between 1900 and 1946. And uh, since then, we established a liberal world order, and that hadn't happened in a long while. A lot of people died, but nowhere near the chaos. And now is a time when things are shifting. We're going to there's going to be a new world order out there, and we've got to lead it. And we've got to unite the rest of the free world in doing it. So anyway, so again, when they tell you, oh, it's just a conspiracy theory, it can't be a conspiracy theory that's unproven when they're saying it out loud this is right. what we're doing exactly. but again listen to what he's saying he's basically saying you know we want to use this crisis and he'd been talking about covid and things to change things he's like don't right. let any good crisis go you know with, without being used and also i find fascinating what he's saying he's basically saying it took 60 million deaths to issue an issue in this world order well what are you saying how many deaths is it going to take to bring the next one in I very mean, good point it's really, I mean, it's just amazing that he's saying this 
out loud. Uh, and, it really and again, is. Uh, Klaus Schwab, the, the World Economic Forum, they talk about the Great Reset. They talk about uh, hacking the human being with, with technology to destroy free will. So, again, it's not backroom speculation. It's, it's no. just using their own words against them. <laughs> and actually, after coming across that um, video footage and the, the speech, the quote, I actually happened upon uh, an old video from 2009, a lecture that our dear predecessor, John Venari, God rest his soul, gave at a Fatima conference mm -hmm. called Fatima and the New World Order. So I'll post oh, a link in our um, in the description to this video so you can find that. But it's very timely, even though it was mm -hmm. several years ago. And it's a topic that Catholic Family News has covered you know, several times over the years, the Bilderberger group and all of that kind of stuff, the elites. Mm -hmm. And John was always so thorough in documenting his sources and it's it's real, it's definitely real. But I did want to, before we uh, move on to the next concerning topic, I did want to <laughs> remind folks that as I tweeted earlier this week, it's important for us to remember that the new world order is not exclusively Western. There is definitely an Eastern branch including none other than Vladimir Putin himself. So mm -hmm. on July 16th, 2001, uh, Putin signed what's called a Treaty of Good Neighborliness and Friendly Cooperation with Communist China. And it says in the text with, quote, the hope of promoting and establishing a just and fair new world order based on universally recognized principles and norms of international laws. So there is definitely an Eastern branch to the deep state, obviously communist China, but also Russia has played that role for many decades as well. So we don't, we shouldn't overlook that fact. Uh, also in this speech to business leaders, interestingly, he brought up, uh, Biden brought up the topic of uh, chemical biological weapons, which is something we'll get into in our next story with Hunter Biden. Um, but he said, referring to Pre President Putin, quote, his back is against the wall and he's now he's talking about new false flags he's setting up. Again, this is Biden about Putin, including he's asserting that we in America have biological as well as chemical weapons in Europe. Simply not true, Biden says. I guarantee you. Well, we'll we'll see about that guarantee in our next story. <laughs> So as readers, just like he here, guaranteed yeah. that laptop and nothing had to do with his son in the presidential debate uh, two yeah. years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So as viewers may know, uh, President Biden went on a trip to Europe recently, uh, specifically for a, a NATO summit, which occurred on March 24th. So the day before the consecration of Russia and Ukraine and the the, the uh, heads of state and government uh, for NATO member states released a, a lengthy statement. We don't have time to cover all of it, but I did want to read a couple of highlights. Um, so they say, again, interestingly, they bring up this issue of chemical or biological weapons, almost like they're signaling, we're really concerned of what's being uncovered on, in Ukraine, you know, and the connections to NATO members and specifically the United States. So they made a point of saying any use by Russia of a chemical or biological weapon would be an unacceptable would be unacceptable and result in severe consequences. Uh, it's kind of like the guilty party kind of saying, you know, revealing their own hand in some ways. Something else very revealing, I think, is this. Statement. Well, I, I don't know if you're going to get to that. That relates to another gaffe that Biden made that they had to walk back. Yeah, he said, "Well, if they use biological weapons, we will uh, basically give. We will reply." In like respond in kind, respond yeah. in kind, and basically everybody understood him as we'll use chemical weapons on them, biological weapons right. on them, which would be, yes. I mean, utterly immoral and illegal. But then right. they had to say, "Oh, that's not what he meant." Reply in kind, we will respond in kind. Man, it'll just respond. Well, it's clearly not what he said. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yes. Um, so in this same speech, or in, this was a the NATO report, the NATO press yeah. release. It says, um, in. Re Hang on. Where was I? OK, here we go. Ukraine has a fundamental right to self-defense. This is what the NATO members say under the United States Charter or United Nations Charter. Excuse me. Since 2014, which happens to be the year <laughs> of the, the, the coup that our country seems to have backed, 
we have provided extensive support to Ukraine's uh, ability to exercise that right. <laughs> That's very interesting considering our involvement in the coup. Mm-hmm. Uh, we And they say, we, NATO nations, have trained Ukraine's armed forces, strengthening their military capabilities and capacities and enhancing their resilience. And then, you know, my comment to that is we wonder why Russia is upset about, <laughs> about you know, the buildup of NATO and that kind of stuff. Not that it's a justification for invading a sovereign nation, but, you know, we got to have some explanations here for what's what provoked mm-hmm. this. And I think we have to take some responsibility where appropriate. Uh, they also acknowledged their concern about the People's Republic of China, calling them out to, quote, uphold the international order, including the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity, to abstain from supporting Russia's war effort in any way, and to refrain from any action that helps Russia circumvent sanctions. I don't think the Chinese Communist Party is going to pay much attention to that appeal. (laughs) Um, So yeah, it just goes on and on with it. This is the last one I'll mention, which again, it's just, they don't apparently don't hear themselves what they're saying. So they say in one paragraph, uh, in response to Russia's actions, we have activated NATO's defense plans, deployed elements of the NATO uh, response force, and placed 40,000 troops on our eastern flank. And in the same paragraph, they say, our measures remain preventative, proportionate, and (laughs) non-escalatory. I don't understand how they can claim that that's non-escalatory. As we escalate. It's not right. They're, they're basically <laughs> gearing up for a full scale invasion of Europe by Russia. I mean, that's how I understand. I don't know right. how else you would understand that. They also mentioned they are establishing four additional multinational battle groups in Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania and Slovakia. And yet this is somehow non escalatory. I don't I don't understand that. Again, and right on that's right on Russia's border. That is if the yes. Russians put troops on the Canadian border. Right. Like that that's the equivalent or the Mexican. Right. Border. So long story short, I mean, the situation over there is still very serious um, yeah. and, and anything could trigger something. And then the very next day, March 25th, the day of the consecration, we have Joe Biden telling a group of U.S. airmen <laughs> yeah. stationed in Poland to help reinforce the NATO troops, quote, and you're going to see when you're there referring to Ukraine. As if our troops are going to be going into Ukraine, another gaffe that the uh, White House press office had to somehow try to cover up, uh, even though they couldn't, because there's video footage showing that he actually said that. And I will give the White House credit. They do publish the transcripts of these uh, yeah. horrible speeches, and it shows right in them. Yeah, they don't remove the, the gaffes. Right, because in the context, he's talking about the difficulty, the suffering in Ukraine while people are suffering. And so when he says, you'll see when you're there, I, I mean, he only can mean when you're in Ukraine. So does he know something we don't know, that he's already decided right. to send them to Ukraine? And the White House, it was pathetic, their walk back. They're like, well, he just meant when you go to meet some Ukrainian soldiers in Poland. Well, no. how would you see civilian suffering when you meet? Like, like it just... It, it makes no sense. And it's clearly he just said something he wasn't supposed to say. I mean, it right, really reminds cool. me, it's kind of very parallel to when Pope Francis blurts out a lot of these things. And then the, the Vatican press office tries to, oh, well, you know, here, here here's what he meant. But right, he doesn't but, come out and say, that's not what I meant. <laughs> exactly. And then he, you know, the very next day of the 26th, he said in a speech, you know, I made it clear that our troops are not going to Ukraine. No, you said the exact opposite, actually. Right. <laughs> So one uh, commentator on Twitter named Andrew Malcolm had this to say in response to these gaffes, two more Biden cleanups on aisle four today. (laughs) In in Poland, the president of the United States tells 82nd Airborne troops they're going to Ukraine, in parentheses, they're not. We hope not anyway. Then he says if Russia uses chemical weapons, the U.S. will respond in kind. We won't in parentheses. And then he says the hashtag, this is getting dangerous. And indeed it is. Um, mm. I mean, the Biden basically should not be allowed to speak in public at this point if he's going to say such reckless, outrageous things when the world is in such a precarious situation. Mm. Um, very, very dangerous indeed. Yes. 
Speaking of dangerous, uh, it's very dangerous to have a, a president who is compromised with foreign governments. In other words, a president uh, who foreign governments could blackmail because they have bad you know, have information about shady things. And that is exactly the point that was made in October of 2020 when yes. uh, his son, Biden's son, Hunter Biden, had a laptop that surfaced. Uh, and uh, you'll recall, as we reported on at the time, Hunter Biden brought his laptop in in 2019 to a repair shop, signed a receipt with his signature for it, and forgot to pick it up. Now, I have a brother-in-law who's in the um, you know, uh, law enforcement, and right. I, he always says, if, if criminals weren't so stupid, I don't think so many of them would get caught. Right? <laughs> so you have a laptop with incriminating information, and you bring it to get repaired and then forget about it and leave it there. <laughs> so right. under the terms of service that he signed when he dropped it off, it said, if you don't pick this up by a certain date, it belongs to us. Yeah. You forfeit your rights to it. It then got turned over, eventually went to the FBI. But you recall uh, at the time, the fake news media, CNN, the Washington Post, they all rallied around and based on no evidence whatsoever, they said, oh, this is not real. It's not Hunter Biden's laptop. It's Russian disinformation. Oh, really? Well, where do you have proof it's Russian? Well, it is. We just know it is. <laughs> Hundreds of, secu of intelligence officers that work for the deep state signed a letter, not having ever seen the laptop, having verified anything. Oh, this is Russian disinformation. It's not true. Uh, several people mentioned in the emails in the laptop, Tony Bobolitsky for one, came out and gave a statement and said, this is all true. These emails, I received right. them. This is all legitimate. And he gave totally evidence ignored. proving that what he's saying is, yes. is the truth. Yeah. Yes. Now, again, this is something that should be very serious because this, uh, what was alleged at the time, the laptop contained photos uh, in linking the son of the president, the person who could become president at that time, to child pornography, to illegal drug use. And the emails linked him to corrupt selling, essentially, of government access to foreign governments and um, uh, companies that there were emails where he was given, he was put on the pay of a Ukrainian company, $50,000 $50, a month. And he was thanked for getting him in to see his dad, who was then vice president. Again, yes. really raising issues of selling political access, but all this was swept under the rug. And now two years later, uh, this is broken. The Washington post comes out and says, uh, actually the laptop's authentic. Cybersecurity experts have reviewed it. They verified from the metadata that these emails are accurate, that has not been tampered with or changed. And uh, yeah, this is Hunter Biden's. Well, thanks. Two and a half, yeah. two and a half years later, after all this damage that's occurred, uh, they're finally admitting that it's true, uh, that it actually belongs to him. And does, Even, I mean, just as a side comment, I was going to say, does anybody seriously think that Joe Biden would have won the election? Uh, if all of this yeah. would have been revealed when it should have been, I, highly yes. doubtful. Uh, highly on top doubtful. of all the fraud and all that stuff, too, you know. Yes. So uh, they've they've admitted it now. The uh, the uh, uh, government, the federal government, is investigating because apparently these the emails uh, have show evidence of tax fraud, tax evasion, money laundering. Surprise, surprise, uh, from the, you know, from uh, by Hunter Biden. There are emails in it that, again, link it to the father. He says that to his daughter, Hunter Biden says to his daughter, well, I'm not as bad as my dad. He makes us pay half the money we get to him. <laughs> wow. uh, amazing. So all of this was swept up. Now they're admitting, oh, yeah, by the way, we lied. What we told you about it being Russian disinformation, uh, it was all true. So again, why people are even watching these these fake news outlets anymore is beyond me when now they're admitting they just outright made this made this up well great credit goes to jack Maxey. he's the used to be the co-host of the pandemic war room um we interviewed him on catholic family news last year in a special report yes. because he obtained a copy of the hard drive from the laptop and has been systematically going through it and and discovering what's there and if you remember if you watch that special report it's available on our, our channels uh, he said, some of it I can't even talk about. It's so morally reprehensible. 
Uh, right. But when he gets the financial corruption, you know, he explains what he found. He's been publishing, making this available. Uh, this was one guy in Florida. Uh, why? Because the massive news media has been covering it up. Well, frankly, his efforts made it undeniable. It just now is too much. So now what's been in, in the emails that Jack Maxey has made public, uh, it's clear that Hunter Biden and his associates in some finance companies that he controlled financed a bio lab in Ukraine that houses deadly viruses, yes. uh, deadly, deadly viruses, Ebola, viruses which could easily be turned into biological weapons. Uh, and again, we reported on this story when the Secretary of State, Assistant Secretary of State, was asked by Senator Marco Rubio, does America fund, has America funded bio uh, weapons facilities in Ukraine? He said, uh, we have not funded <laughs> bio yes. weapons. We funded bio laboratories yes. that have deadly biotoxins, and which even the World Health Organization has said that should be destroyed. They should not be there. Too right. dangerous. Now, again, Putin is is not, you know, it's not the uh, the the savior of the world. He's not necessarily a good guy. But it, it's interesting that he claimed one of his reasons for invading Ukraine is there were bio weapons facilities financed by the United States and and the Biden family. Denials, denials, lies, lies, lies. Oh, actually, now it was financed by the Biden family uh, in yeah. these emails that Jack Maxey has made, made public. So it's really just another reminder. If you get tempted to turn on CNN, don't. Uh, because it's just you can't trust them. I mean, how can you trust an outlet that outright lied two years ago and then quietly after everybody hopefully forgot about it? Well, actually, it was all true. We were and, and uh, you know, they basically have been bragging that what they did was influential in the election. So they're worried about Russian interference in the election. What about the news media's interference in the election? Uh, no one's asking that question. Yes. And uh, even CNN and of all people now is saying um, that their uh, yes. legal analyst is saying there's a realistic chance that Hunter Biden could be indicted. As Brian mentioned earlier, he is currently yes. under investigation uh, by federal prosecutors in the state of Delaware. So, you know, this is not going to be something that's just shoved under the rug. It sounds like it is finally they're finally doing what they should have done. Uh, what a year and a half ago now, uh, October 2020. Um, so yeah, we'll hope we'll hope and see yes. see what happens with this. But hopefully, it does lead to a full exposure of the corruption and and a conviction of some you know of Hunter and whoever else. Sadly, it sounds like even the sitting you know the punitive president of the United States would be included in the the group of folks who need to be prosecuted and and uh, yes convicted so we'll see what happens we'll see again the same outfit cnn that said nothing to see here pay no attention to the corruption behind the curtain now yeah. it's as soon oh, as it's good might. for ratings now they want right. to get in on the pie exactly exactly well turning from state corruption to church corruption we turn our eyes <laughs> to chicago <laughs> yes all right so uh, the first outlet that i saw report on this uh, they probably were given a, a, a VIP invitation, the National Catholic Reporter, or as John used to say, the National Catholic Distorter, yes. <laughs> uh, published an article earlier this week called Cardinals Theologians Gather to Plan How U.S. Church Can Support Pope Francis. And obviously, we know the National Catholic Reporter is very liberal, very modernist, and wants to help facilitate the the acceptance of the Vatican II revolution as much as they can. So their report reads uh, at the beginning, a group of about 70 cardinals, bishops, and theologians gathered privately for two days here from March 25th to 26th. Again, so another overlap with the consecration, another irony here, mm. uh, for, con for conversations focused on how the U.S. Catholic Church can better support the agenda of Pope Francis. The report continues through a series of uh, keynote presentations and panel discussions centered on tracing the roots of Francis's papacy to the Second Vatican Council. That's good that they're showing the continuity, I suppose. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> this group, this pre the um, conference invited participants also considered, excuse me, our participants who were invited 
also considered the opposition the Pope continues to face from some quarters of the U.S. church more than nine years after his election. And apparently one of the cardinals in attendance was none other than the uber corrupt uh, Cardinal Oscar Rodriguez Maradiaga from Honduras. If you want to find out more about his uh, misdeeds and corruption, you can listen to Brian's interview of um, who was it? Matthew Hoffman, I think, the author right. of the yes. Secret Betrayals, a book yes. about the the life and infamous corruption of the Honduran cardinal. So these are some comments. And again, from- he's ahead, very yeah. powerful. He's called the Vice Pope. He is yes. really the the power behind the throne. He has been the chief henchman. Uh, and again, as we as my, as Mr. Hoffman and I talk about now, he is under the complete protection of Francis, even though the things that have been documented uh, that he did in Honduras are, you know, he should not be in any office in the church. No, uh, but, it, but the fact that he was there means Francis is well aware of and behind this secret, this secret gathering of uh, of the of them to to figure the how they're going to suppress the more conservative leaning American bishops. Exactly. So these are some comments that Cardinal uh, Rodriguez Maradiaga made to uh, National Catholic Reporter, or maybe it was in during one of the public sessions, but it's, he's quoted as saying, we have this what they call, quote, opposition to the Pope. It's trying to build walls, going backwards, looking to the old liturgy, or maybe things before Vatican II, shudder. <laughs> and then he goes on, Vatican II is unknown by many of the young generation, so it's necessary to come back and to see that all the reforms of Pope Francis are rooted in Vatican II. Well, I think in that that statement we can agree with. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, see. that's kind of the quiet part again out loud is wonderful yes. that they're so admitting this is Vatican II. So again, if you're what they're really saying is what we've said all along. If you don't like what Francis is doing, you shouldn't like Vatican II. I mean, they're saying right. it the opposite way. If you agreed right. with Vatican II, you got to agree with this. Uh, so again, it, it, it's kind of a confirmation of the traditionalist position all along that Francis is the logical outcome of Vatican II. Yes, and uh, LifeSite News also reported on the same story, and they report. Let's see here. Well, interesting in that while you're uh, looking for that is they they included a, a tweet of uh, really one of the court apologists for his horrible uh, Chinese deal, surrender the Chinese, a theologian at Villanova University, Massimo Figioli, uh, uh, yes. again, is a, a real sycophant apologist. Uh, and again, it's almost like, why are you doing this? He's like got to brag. I'm in the, I'm in the in group. Interesting yeah. days today and tomorrow for the U S Catholic church. Stay tuned. Like <laughs> I'm in the know with the, the big wigs uh, who are here. Uh, and then National Catholic Reporter, sorry to be missing RNA 2022, but there's an important Catholic conference in Chicago at the same time. And what's important about LifeSite is they report they had really two goals. One was to go after the conservative bishops, but two was to go after Catholic media that are you know, not towing the Francis party line. So who knows? Maybe Catholic Family News was mentioned in their unhallowed halls. <laughs> it's very possible. And it's also interesting that this meeting happened in Chicago. You know, it, again, confirmation that uh, Cardinal Blaise Supich of Chicago is basically the mouthpiece of Francis in the United States. This meeting, the secretive meeting, also included the Apostolic Nuncio to the United States, Archbishop Christophe Pierre, who we've, we've reported some of his remarks in previous shows, and he's clearly... A very in, very much in lockstep with Pope Francis and the uh, synodality and all of that stuff. Yes. So uh, <clears throat> interesting to see if any anything further will come of this, but it's clearly they're they're concerned, or they wouldn't be having such a meeting. They're concerned that tradition is on the rise and is resurgent, you know, especially among young people. So we got to keep up our, you know, keep keep spreading tradition throughout the church, especially with the younger generations and uh, help with the restoration. So, yes, very much so. Well, we'll end uh, with a a really beautiful story, a sad story, but a a beautiful um, 
a reminder how we shouldn't forget these things. Today, March 31st, marks the 17th uh, anniversary of the death of Terry Schiavo. Um, and uh, one of our, our own, Chris Ferraro, is one of the attorneys who worked on, there were many attorneys, but he worked uh, on her case, was involved in, in her case. Uh, and the, the beautiful part is a, really a beautiful tribute uh, was penned by her brother uh, for publication in honor of this anniversary of her of her death. Um, here I'll just show you. It's from Li LifeSite News, and there's a, a picture he included. Uh, and uh, this story ended 17 years ago, but it actually began in 1990 uh, when she suffered a brain injury. And interestingly, because uh, he unveils the story, it was a brain injury suffered at home while home alone with her husband. Um, that's going to be important because what happened is uh, she suffered this brain injury. One of the effects was it, 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 it eliminated her ability to swallow. So she could digest food perfectly well, but her, her ability to swallow was injured. So she needed a feeding tube to get the food into her stomach. Right. Um, she was uh, placed into care. She was, she was, uh, you know, uh, injured, but she certainly was uh, living and all she had to be was fed with the feeding tube and, and Which, cared for. And I just want um, to clarify at this point in history, basically a feeding tube, if your body is able to process food, that's considered an ordinary means. You know, ordinary means. Speaking, yes. Right. Yes. right. Yes. Giving food is an ordinary means and giving a through a feeding tube now is very ordinary. It's very straightforward. Yeah. Um, but the husband kept pressing her husband to uh, remove the feeding tube. And uh, it's interesting because you might be saying, well, maybe it was very costly. Well, there was a huge medical trust that was put together for her care, which would have cared for her for, the, for decades. Uh, right. Millions of dollars were in there. But interestingly, if she died and they didn't need the money anymore, her husband was the beneficiary of the money. So that's what in the crime investigation they call a motive. He also, after she went into care and got all his money for her care, so she was taken care of, he had a live-in girlfriend, the brother tells us, oh, that he couldn't marry because he was adulterous. Uh, she, he's an adulterer because he was already married and she was still alive. So again, motive on motive. Uh, he insisted against the wishes of all of her family to pull the feeding tube so that she would die. Uh, and it involved then a uh, multi-year court battle, which ultimately ended with, this is the sad part for our country, a judge saying, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you're the husband. You can do it. You can pull the plug. Uh, and so they pulled the feeding tube, and her brother says she died a horrible death of starvation. Again, this isn't like when someone is on maybe on a, a respirator or something that you, you pull the plug and they die. You know, within minutes, uh, this was a days of an agonizing death where he describes sitting by her bedside, uh, watching her starve to death. Uh, and, uh, she, you know, she it was a Catholic family um, and they, they knew this was wrong. But it really this shows us the great power of 1984, Big Brother State, uh, that, uh, that this, instead of coming into the state, you're doing protect life. Say, I don't care that you were married to her. A, this is highly suspicious. You, you're, you're of a conflict of interest. We are, we are going to, as the state, protect the rights. That's what we're here for, to protect the citizens, protect her, her rights. And you can't just kill her. Uh, but instead, they lent their support to his plan to kill her. He inherited the money, went off with his girlfriend uh, into the sunset. So really, I think it's, I, we wanted to take this time to honor her memory uh, to yes. honor her family who fought for the morally right thing to do, uh, to honor all those lawyers who fought to the Supreme Court and back to try to to save her life. And uh, again, ultimately, they they failed in saving her life. But as so many things, God often you know looks on our failure and rewards us for our intentions and for standing up for the for the truth. So right. remember, if we're going to be pro-life, we have that that's more than being pro-birth, more than being don't abort. We have to really, honor the, the first principle of the natural law uh, to preserve yes. life and that God is the master of life and that we don't just get to decide whether a child's inconvenient or a, a woman who 
is is now lost a lot of her function and is needs care. We don't just say that's too hard. That's too messing up my life to go go to, you know, for other reasons and just end their life. So uh, an honor to uh, to them. To, and, and we want to just you know end our show by honoring her family and the fight they fought. Yes. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, we thank yeah. everyone who has uh, joined us live today for our weekly news roundup. We thank you so much for joining us. And if you've enjoyed today's show, please uh, give us a thumbs up, like, and also share uh, with family and friends on social media, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you hang out on social media. That really does help us to grow our audience and get the message out there far and wide. And if you enjoy the free content that we make available, that we produce on a weekly basis, uh, this show or on our website, um, other special reports, we do ask for your support in the form of a subscription to our monthly publication, Catholic Family News. If you visit our website, catholicfamilynews.com, you'll find the information there Then the tab, new subscription towards the top. And yes, our, our uh, April paper it, will it. will be out tomorrow, April 1st, electronically. Yes. It'll be put in the mail after that point, and the mails take a while. But electronically, all subscribers will have access through Zinio to, to it. Uh, some great information. We have a great article by Mariana Bartold providing a lot of interesting background to help us assess this consecration to think about it. Uh, we have, obviously, a report on it, uh, on the consecration itself. Uh, we have a follow-up reflection on one of the stories we did on the Puerto Rican bishop uh, that was removed by Pope Francis, further analysis. So it really, yes. again, if you enjoy the things on the news program here, uh, you will find even more information and, and different information that you won't find here. A real mix of inspirational, uh, uh, good spiritual reading, reflections yes. on the catechism, the commandments, et cetera, but then also analysis and to keep you informed on uh, what's happening in the church. So please, it, it is our main uh, avenue of support for the media apostle that we run is the subscription income from the, the paper, which for just an electronic subscription is only $32 uh, a year, so less than $3 a month. Yes. Uh, and uh, for the paper to get the paper delivered, in addition to that, is only in the U.S. at least only forty-two dollars, so less than four dollars a month. Uh, you know, that's you know less than a cup of Starbucks coffee a month. Right. <laughs> not that not that we're advertising for them their their coffee, which I can't stand, but uh, right. just to put it in perspective. Yes, thank you for thank you all for your support, and we will close as we always do by invoking Our Lady and praying together a Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the instruments of his holy passion. Thou may put division in the camp of thy enemies. For as thy beloved Son has said, a kingdom divided against itself shall fall. St. Vincent Ferrer. Pray for us. St. Isidore, Isidore of Seville. Pray for us. Our Lady of Fatima. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, that's another week from the, our view at Catholic Family News. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to joining you next time and wish you a holy and fruitful Passion Tide. Yes. Oh.